you want the legend of the Blair Witch. The legend of the Blair Witch is long and involved, and, and in my opinion, it's mostly just stories to scare children. Started in, in, back in the 1700s, uh, the stories began circulating, and supposedly, as I understand, about a witch in the area, uh, some old woman that was cursing people, that was doing things, I don't know all that, but she became the witch of the area. As I understand, she might even have been put to death over it. Uh, years progressed from there. Every bad thing that happened to the town, it was the Blair Witch causing. You know, people just have to find something to tag, someone to label as the cause of things. The Blair Witch became that for this area, for Burkittsville. Quite some time again after that, a child drowned in the river, and, and people attributed that to the Blair Witch, which there, there's absolutely nothing to substantiate that. So I understand it was a shallow part of the river, and but there were claims supposedly that the child was pull, seen being pulled down by a hand in the river. You know, the fact that a forest is drowning in shallow water, I mean, I, I know people have drowned in soup bowls. So you can't tell me that eight inches of water is not too shallow for someone to drown in. Uh, a child did go missing after the child drowned, and a young boy, I believe. A search party went out looking for the young boy. The young boy was recovered. The search party never came back. So they sent out a search party for the search party, and they came across the bodies found on Coffin Rock, right by the river, and uh, there every member of the search party was dead. They were not just dead, they were mutilated. They were hacked to pieces. I'm not denying that that ever happened. That's a fact, that happened, but it got attributed to the Blair Witch, and, and I don't see how that happened. There was the, the Rustin Parr incident, which became attributed to the Blair Witch in some way or another, because Rustin Parr claimed that he did what he did because an old woman told him to, or the old witch. It's been said in different ways. The most recent incidents that we've had happen is these uh, three college kids. Uh, went out into the woods in uh, the Burkittsville area. They were going to make themselves a documentary concerning the Blair Witch, and they went missing, and they were assumed dead, and then sometime later, their equipment was found. They uh, pieced together the material found. There were a lot of videotapes, film reels and stuff, and they managed to piece this together in what they think implies that the Blair Witch attacked them and killed them. This is just really, this is absolutely more of the uh, urban legend being built up. These kids aren't missing. They aren't dead. This is just a sick joke. It's a, a kind of stuff that, that sad, sick people perform on these kind of events. That's the Blair Witch legend. told, you know, don't do that, Rustin Parr is going to get you. Go to sleep and be quiet or Rustin Parr is going to get you. Well, this is my collection of cameras, uh, predominantly Super 8, 16 millimeter here. This is the camera that I got from my parents, though. It used to have a viewfinder on it. Hey, I, I kind of was just attracted to uh, the odd angles in here, you know. I think they had a gun in part of the roof. is just a nice flat roof. Then you come into another area where the bedroom is, and it's a peaked roof. And well, basically, I've been working in film all my life. The projector that I've used for years, not in not in Hollywood, not make, making it as a filmmaker, but yeah, I have some stuff that, um, well, probably has not seen too many eyes. Um, yeah. Let's see. OK, we got it. We got it right here. This is my Rustin Parr treasure box. Well, it, it initially, it wasn't just Rustin Parr. I just kind of always had a fascination with serial killers. Convicted murderer Rustin Parr executed for Burkittsville killings. Transcripts from the trial. Here's Rustin uh, giving his testimony. I mean, that was just one of the one of the few times I had someone like that, a serial killer of that that repute, that was like in my own backyard that I could could possibly find something out myself. Why did you do it, Mr. Parr? I heard voices in my head. I heard voices, Mr. Parr. 
No idea who it was. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. I'm Bill Barnes, the executive director of the Burkittsville Historical Society and the historian of Burkittsville. It's my responsibility there to, to teach the children the history of our area because we we're at close to three larger towns, Rockville, uh, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C., which are all fairly historical, but I don't want them to lose a touch with the fact that we have a pretty good historical town too. Let's go back, say, to the uh, fall of 1940. And then Burkittville being a small town, everybody knew everybody, usually by, or most of them by their first name. But we had some kids disappearing in town. And they were mostly between the ages of six and eight. It wasn't long after that, and Mr. Park came into town and walked in Mr. Smith or Mr. Stryker's door. I don't know which one, one of the general stores, who depend on who was telling the story as to where he went. But he come in and he f said the words that has become famous in Burkittville, is that I have finally finished. Well, they didn't know what he meant. And they asked him, he said, I've killed those children. Mr. Brown, how did you get the children into the woods? Promise them things. What kind of things, Mr. Brown? Candy. He, um, was charged and convicted with the uh, abduction of eight children and the murder of seven children in that area. And you killed other children that we don't know about, Mr. Park? No. Come here, Mr. Park. Rustin was basically, up until that point, he was a pretty harmless guy. He was friendly, he was nice. All of a sudden, he became this monster, the demon of Burkittsville, as they referred to him at times. How did you kill the children? I don't think anybody ever thoroughly looked at the, the story. People just assumed things about Rustin Parr. They decided that certain things were this way, and they never did a thorough investigation. Rustin's mother and father, they died around the 30s. And at that time already, Rustin was, Rustin was already living out in the, in the backwoods. He was very uncomfortable in society, and society was very uncomfortable with him. When he was arrested for killing seven, seven children in Burkittsville, and I was serving that prison, uh, I heard his confession, which I have kept as a private vow for, what, 50 years now. Just like all the other sort of these tales to scare children, that kind of thing, uh, Rustin had this reputation, just like the uh, sort of the old scary house in the neighborhood where People say, oh, you know, whoever lives there, if you go near the house, they'll put a curse on you or something like that. Mr. Carl, why those seven children? That's what the voices told me. I'm finally finished. Those were the words that are attributed to him. I have asked around to anyone who might have been a survivor of that time. I can't find anybody who is willing to say they know that Rustin Parr said those words. I'm finally finished. He said, I'm finally finished. And that was his acceptance of death, I think. It had nothing to do with the crime. Everybody said, ah, oh. but I don't think it had anything to do with the crime. So they got the sheriff, come down, and he arrested him. And he went up to the cabin, and sure enough, he found seven bodies, not eight, but seven. And the eighth one that they didn't find was Kyle Brody. While they were looking for the the bodies in the home and uncovering those bodies kyle brody comes walking back into the town of burkittsville and he's starts telling people about rustin parr and what rustin parr has been doing for the last year how rustin parr held him captive there in his home how rustin parr was committing these horrible unspeakable acts to these children but uh, he came back in town he testified against him at the trial you know i do i do not know why they took me to that trial. I mean, what were they thinking? Taking a child my age to hear someone testify about killings and murders, and, and there were all these people, they were all around. I just remember there were so many people all around, and they were staring at Kyle. And I remember angry voices. I remember a tall man with glasses shouting and pointing at someone who I think was Rustin Parr. And I remember, I guess it was the judge banging. And, and I remember Kyle sitting in this big box, just staring straight ahead, not looking at anyone. And those eyes of his just looking straight ahead. 
and answering these questions. He begins telling everyone what happened to him over this time, that, that he's been locked into Rustin Parr's home, into one of the uh, rooms in the upstairs, and, and periodically he would be brought out by Rustin Parr, who then, according to Kyle Brody, Rustin Parr would face him into a corner, while Rustin Parr then performed these atrocities on these children. And I just remember Kyle's face all white and pale and his eyes all blue-gray. and Almost as though he didn't want to see what he had seen. He didn't want to say what he was about to say. He didn't want to know what he had come to know. Uh, he had details about Emily Holland's abduction. Emily Holland was abducted an entire two weeks before Kyle Brody went missing. And yet he knows events about the abduction about where Parr found her in the woods and, and abducted her and brought her back to his place. Now, justice being real swift, they uh, took him down in Rockville behind the jail where the gallows was and hung him. He seemed to get some pleasure from telling them the stories they wanted to hear. And, uh, and it, 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 they would have hung him anyway. I think that the decision was made that Rustin Parr was guilty before anybody had a chance to even look at the facts. It was all decided as they were marching up the hills to Rustin Parr's home. And then with the boy coming in at the same time and laying out his story, by the time they came back with what they were looking at as conclusive evidence, it was done. Here's one on a young Parr victim put in, <clears throat> put in institution. Living Parr victim leading difficult life. Poor Kyle's suffering. There's Kyle Brody. One of his many trips before the law. And we had a boy there in town named Kyle Brody. Kyle was a weird sort of kid. And uh, being like he was, the, some of the things he liked to do was he, he'd like to catch cats and stuff them in a mailbox. But Kyle Brody, uh, when we first saw him, I, I determined almost immediately that uh, he belonged away from society. He belonged in a mental institution. He was, he was obviously mentally ill. I remember I used to see him outside playing by the stream all the time. The classic tearing wings off of flies, that's nothing. But he would also take the frogs out of the river. He'd capture them, and he would chop the legs off of the frogs. He wouldn't kill the frogs first. And so apparently Kyle came home that day and filled one of his buckets with frogs. And he began cutting off the legs of one of these frogs. Until eventually all four legs were chopped off, and there was just this horrible, uh, painful creature writhing on the ground. My mother said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm, I'm trying to see if frogs have feelings. Children who've been abused, they sometimes take things out on small animals or insects. They said that's the first sign of a psychological disturbance in a child. He believed that he was severely physically beaten as a child by his father. My feeling is that this was probably not so. All I can tell you is he believed it. My father wanted Kyle to be a man, and he disciplined him very harshly at times schizophrenic personality there is no way to substantiate what they're saying is true or not unless of course you have another family member who will corroborate it in this case we did not there's history of the boy being a problem child a very difficult child to deal with when he disappeared the parents thought he had run away so they were rather surprised when he came back with his story of being abducted Rustin Parr abducted eight children one of them was my brother Seven of those children were butchered by that man. My brother was forced to stand facing a wall while other children were killed behind him. He could hear the sounds, he could hear them screaming, not knowing what was going to happen next. What is the reasoning behind having a child face a corner for all this? It's just, it's just illogical. And this man butchered these seven children. How Kyle ever got away, I have no idea. I think, in my opinion, from some of the facts that I've gathered, from some of the experiences I've had in my life as well, that what might have happened actually was that Kyle Brody had actually planned this from the beginning. Kyle was a beautiful child, though. Perhaps his man fancied him. Perhaps he thought he could get sexual favors from Kyle. Perhaps Kyle may even have provided those to save his own life. I don't know. And then to turn around and say that my brother killed those children 
those children were his friends. The, the, the seven children that died, none of these children knew every one of the other children that were missing. The only person out of the entire group that did know all eight of the children abducted was Kyle Brody. But he liked to fight. He'd always fight with the other kids. And he didn't care how big he was. He'd dump on and fight with them. He had past histories with them. Some of them troubled past. There's some uh, records, of no, not records, but knowledge of from the people I've talked to of there being disturbances between Kyle and some of the other kids. And one day he tried to pick a fight with me, but I never thought nothing about fighting. Kyle Brody was involved with the abduction of Emily Hollins, hence he knows all these facts and details about it. Ruskin Pryor had never threatened anyone in any way. He was a peaceful person. And I just don't believe that he had it in him to perform these acts, these, these, these atrocious acts that were done to these children. This kid had it in him to develop the, these ideas, these schemes, these plans. And I think that he is the one who led Rustin Parr through every one of these things. I don't think he stood there with his face facing a corner during all this. I think he was there taking Rustin Parr's hand, putting the knife in it, and having him do this, because he would need someone with the strength of an adult to do some of these acts. But he was the one that was making the uh, decisions, and he was the one guiding Rustin Parr through this. <laughs> I met Kyle Brody in the late 60s when I was assigned to uh, the psychiatric ward of the uh, Maryland State Institute for the Criminally Insane. I'd heard about him before I got there uh, because he was quite infamous and his case uh, made quite a number of newspapers. The state of the mental institutions when uh, Kyle Brody was first incarcerated, of course, is um, nowhere near as humane as they are now. He was a legendary dark figure in the hospital. He was this last incarcerated link to this uh, heinous multiple murder that had taken place in 1940. Kyle Brody's pharmacological chart was all over the place when I first met him. They tried everything probably known to man and nothing was working. And I read that and I said, this, this has got to stop. He had apparently been taking the medication that had reduced him to catatonia. And, and at first they, they thought that the medication itself had created the catatonia or had created the climate for catatonic, you know, and he just like rigid like this. I narrowed it down to, to two or three uh, medications that I felt we could zero in on uh, what would be the, uh, uh, the outcome that we were looking for. I discussed it with Dr. Miles, and we decided to narrow it down even more, which we did. I mean, these medications are so potent. They're, they're just, they're, the, the side effects are unspeakable. And I remember him laying in this bed, rigid. And I remember looking down at him, and he wouldn't, couldn't speak. He couldn't speak. The medication I had originally suggested, he finally agreed, yes, we both agreed, let's try that. We did it, and there were some noticeable changes. Then I noticed he had changed. He was back again. And I found out later that uh, Dr. Hall had switched the medication without consulting with me. And I remember looking down at the sheets, and I remember seeing that the sheets were wet, and they were soiled. I was so upset. I called the orderly and I said, what? You've got to change him. And the orderly, I get this, the orderly said, we want to teach him to go to the bathroom on his own. We're dealing with human beings, not just the patients. I would imagine that those that work there, particularly in subsidiary positions, such as guards and interns and uh, orderlies, can probably get carried away and perhaps get into abuse of the patients. I told mom and dad, and I said, we had to get him out of there. But they couldn't, they couldn't afford to. Kyle Brody's sister, I guess you could say, was um, one of the many thorns in the side of, of a system that was already full of thorns. Um, she was convinced that Kyle, that her brother was not insane. 
and did everything to the best of her ability to keep him out of a mental institution. Kyle Brody, I, I'm not going to say that he had an easy existence after the Rustin Parr uh, trial, but I mean, certainly, it, it, I think it's better than being hung, but uh, he became a rather aggressive panhandler where it wasn't really an option for people to walk away and not give him something. He also had incidents of shoplifting. He has uh, robberies, uh, not armed robberies, but you know, very violent, aggressive things. So he tended to spend most of his time in a couple of different institutions, and uh, that's actually where he died as well. I, I, I'm not seeing anything. I'm not, I have nothing to base my, my uh, opinions of the adult Kyle Brody on until I hear about this film called White Enamel. I don't call them documentaries. I don't like the term documentary very much. Uh, it, it conjures up something stale and boring to most people. So I call them nonfiction films. White Enamel was a documentary, a black and white documentary, shot back in the 60s in uh, various, in, 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 well, in insane asylums in Maryland. Uh, they they tend, to, tend to center on one in particular, which, wonder of wonders, is the very same institution that Kyle Brody spent a great deal of time at. I think I expected a certain thing when I went in into the hospital there, and it was completely different than I, than I thought. And I, I took a deep breath and I jumped off the cliff. I let it happen as it was happening. You know, I should be a Vietnam. I could be a general. I mean, yeah, I could. But no, Nixon and, and Kissinger, they, they don't want to share no glory at all. My father was in World War II. He, he was a gunner's mate on the USS Idaho. And I'm here because of Richard Milhouse, Nixon, and Mr. Kissinger. I am here. They're hearing right now what I'm saying. They don't fool me. They're hearing what I'm saying. Huh. The mailman was bugging, yeah. He's just not looking at our mail. He's bugging this whole place. David Hooper, I think when he made the film, he was almost an innocent. And I think he was also heroic in a way. I mean, he, it's a heroic act to take on this kind of inhumanity. I doubt very highly that most people know they're doing a heroic act when they're in the middle of doing it. You know, you just, something propels you into this. And, and you either have the balls to follow it through or you don't. And he did. So how long have you been in here? How long have you been in here? I've been here a, a long time. Oh, a lot of, lot of, lot of years. A lot of years? Why are you in here? I don't, uh, I don't know why they, they said, they told me. I asked David Hooper about that, how he made the decision to do that. He, I knew he thought it was powerful. He had no idea how powerful it was going to be. But he knew he had to say something about how humankind in general can treat the unwanted and how this culture is a beautiful culture and doesn't tolerate what's ugly. And um, so that as this frame after frame after frame starts to stack up, you know, at first you think, oh, man, I just don't want to watch this. It's too tedious beyond words. And then all of a sudden you go, this would be very hard to live with. This would be a very difficult job to have. Who gets this job? Who wants this job? What are the families of the people who treat these people this way? Whose dad shoves a tube down some guy's nose and pours lunch? into their stomach. No. And what's the kid like that lives in that family? How far out do the ripples of this go? And all of a sudden, questions are being asked without you even knowing them. Because there is no linear context to this film, because it doesn't have a beginning, middle, and an end, it has a beginning, middle, and end at all times. So. It is a life force that's coming at you. 
not a tidy picture. White enamel is a, uh, well, it was, it was a really, it was a very exciting point for me. I get to look at this thing and, and it, it's mind blowing. I mean, the film itself is an interesting film as far as the uh, information you can glean from it as to how in, inmates are treated in insane asylums. That's interesting, but I, I'm not really that interested in that. There is actually about five minutes worth of footage approximately of Kyle Brody as an adult there is a scene of Kyle Brody in his cell, and he's chanting something. And, and, and what he's chanting is the phrase, a two-word phrase, never given. Never given. Never given. Never given, never given, never given. He's chanting that. And what this means, the importance to this, is there's actual a reported fact from the guards that watched over Rustin Parr on a suicide watch while he was waiting to, to be killed. They, they have reports of Rustin Parr screaming the words never given. The same two words, never given. To say Kyle Brody creeped me out would be putting it mildly. Kyle Brody was every nightmare you've ever had as a kid. That, that guy played with my head. Everything I asked him to do, he would do the opposite. I don't know what the phrase means, never given, but here is another connection. Rustin Parr is chanting never given or screaming yell never given. Kyle Brody is chanting it in his cell. So I didn't stop there. I know enough about filmmaking to know that if you have less than five minutes of Kyle Brody in your film, there could probably be another maybe an hour's worth of footage of Kyle Brody that was never put into the film. Filmmakers overshoot. So I began to look for David Hooper. He was very forthcoming with information. He did remember Kyle Brody. Kyle Brody made it quite an impression on him. He's in the film, he, he's, he's a very intense figure. And then he told me that he had other footage of Kyle Brody. Chris is a maniac, and uh, I recognize myself at the same age. Uh, it takes brass balls to do some of the stuff that he's doing. I begged, I pleaded, I cajoled, I bribed everything I could, and he, he was willing to send me the extra footage that he had. That stuff was a mess. I did everything I could to restore this before I even began to look at it, built it up into the best shape I could, watched this stuff, and there I found another very interesting key. There was a shot in this rec room of this insane asylum, and, and, and Kyle Brody is there with this large art notepad, and he's writing on the notepad. And what is being written on that notepad, <clears throat> being written from right to left, the way it is supposed to be written, is transitus fluvia, the language, the witchcraft language. No, no, this is not a common language. It's not known all around the world. Very few people know this. And here is Kyle Brody, to the best of my knowledge, that is what he's writing in his transitus fluvii. I, I took this footage and I took whatever stills I could grab from it and, and, and tried to find people who could substantiate this. Chris Carrasco found me um, through my website. And he, you know, sent me a, an email and it said, I have this piece of footage from the late 60s and I need you to analyze it and take a look at it. He wanted me to figure out and analyze what this particular gentleman was drawn, and he was convinced that I could do it. And I was equally convinced that there was no way that you could conclusively say 
what this individual w was drawing. And she, she got some improvements, but she could not verify for sure from what she found that it was what I was hoping, the transitus fluvii. I, I found another woman, a Kendra Feynman, who actually is relatively fluent in this. Chris brought that to me and asked if I could tell him what that was. So after examining that footage, we determined that this gentleman actually was riding in transitus fluvii. You can see very clearly the little circle embellishments at the end, the little loops at the end of the letters. And she looked at this and, and she fairly quickly was able to decide that this was transitus fluvii. And that language was mostly really used in secret societies and cults and different sects and with witches that um, lived and practiced in Europe. And this is what Kyle Brody is writing from right to left, the way the transitus fluvii is written as if the he as in the Hebrew language. They're saying that there is a cult of alphabets or, or you know, they can tell what they're writing because that's what they want to believe. That's their theory. And so that's what they're bearing out. I saw him writing, I saw how he was writing, and I, based on my own knowledge of a language, could decipher those characters. You cannot start with a theory and then look for it in the photograph. You have to take the photograph or the piece of film as a separate entity, analyze it on its merits alone. Then if there's some correspondence with the theorem, then great. But if there isn't, you need to let it go. Now, this is the exact same language that we find on the walls of the upstairs of Rustin Parr's home, transitus fluvii, written by this kid who has a high IQ and might have somehow picked this up at some stage in his life as compared to the possibility of Rustin Parr, a man who was illiterate, could not read or write at all in, in English, the idea of him writing transitus fluvii language all over the walls of his home. It's absurd. This is a very important key piece of evidence that I've found that I think links Kyle Brody to these murders. And it's not really being considered that seriously. As I was poring over the ideas of the Rustin Parr case and thinking about Rustin, who is this rather simple fellow, or actually, I mean, actually a simpleton, and this child, this, 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 this magnetic, charming child of Kyle Brody, who I think has manipulated Rustin Parr, made him do his bidding, if not actually holding his hand and leading him to it, directing him still through every action, through the abduction of Emily Hollins, which Kyle Brody should not have known anything about, but he did, to all the actions of each of the deaths within the basement of that house. I think it was Kyle Brody leading him through this. Now this story of what happened in Rustin Parr's cabin is being told by an unreliable witness who is insane, who is also the person, in my opinion, responsible for every one of the murders. These are things that once you start putting them together, once you start thinking of all the facts, it'll shake your, your beliefs and, and everything that you know so far. At one short time ago, there was a guy from Ohio who started researching the death of those seven children. And he came up with a theory that nobody else had ever come up with, that, that Mr. Parr did not kill those children, that Kyle Brody was actually the murderer. Rustin Parr was tired of living in the way he was living. But I guess I've told you something of what he told me in confession. But he told me that he had killed no one. Not just me, he told his God that he had killed no one. And I asked him, I said, well, let me go to the judge with this story. Let me tell the people. And he said, no, this is my confession. You have no right to take it anywhere. Hal Brody was caught up in a situation that no 12-year-old should ever have to uh, live through. And uh, I think that's what triggered some deep-seated illnesses that, that uh, manifested itself later in life. I think he lived in a world of his own. And who can say what goes on inside a person's head, but perhaps that world got to be too much for him. Carl Brody wasn't any older than the kids that got killed. He was just a kid himself. He was mean, that's, that's true. But I don't think he'd ever had the stomach to kill those kids. Well, searching for the truth is not an easy thing. Uh, it's not something that most people want to face. 
Uh, I have generally found that once people set their minds on what has happened, if you start offering them any sort of alternate idea, especially if it's something that really goes against this happy world that they've set up for themselves, you become hated for it. Chris Carrasco is a blooming fucking idiot. He's just some bozo who's trying to drum up publicity for himself with this preposterous hypothesis about a very inflammatory subject anyway. I've, I've talked to people that I could, that might have known Kyle, uh, people that would talk to me. His sister won't have anything to do with me after she found out my angle. Janine Brody has just closed herself up, but I think she has information that would be very handy. I would love to talk to her in an open, free way. I guess I would like to see Chris Carrasco and just deck him. Well, you can make what you want of it. I don't I don't tell you that this is absolutely what happened, that this is the only way it could happen, that this is God's honest truth. I'm not saying that. All I'm offering you is my viewpoint on it. Do I think Kyle Brody is a killer? Could be. Kyle is simply, was simply incapable of doing violence to someone else. I mean, finally, he did violence to himself. I've looked at everything with an open mind. I did not set myself on anything, and I've gotten every fact I could, and then I put them together into an hypothesis. Then I put them together into a hypothesis. Now, you tell me anyone else that does it. You introduce them to me, you show me their material, and then I'll be happy to change my opinion. Nobody else has done the work I've done. You're welcome to go off and think whatever you want. I'm not telling you what to think, but this is what I've come to, and this is the conclusion I found. That's it. I, I do I do take them out and I do uh, as I said experimental pieces it's it's I'm not so much into storytelling now as as capturing imagery as some of it may be a little on the disturbing side here's Rustin being hung on the gallows nice close-up basically I, I go out and I will capture images and occasionally annoy the hell out of people these are my babies this is a actual copy of the newsreel footage announcing Rustin Parr's execution and going over the testimony, the court case as well. This was extremely difficult to come across. I have never felt that I've gone overboard on this. And, and once, you, I, once you start looking into this and getting a, a glimmer of what's going on here, I find it really hard to, to turn myself away. And it amazes me that these other people don't want to find out more about this. He's, he's creating pain for these parents. And he's... <sighs> he's taking my brother's name in vain, to put it mildly. I can be touched by someone walking down the street who, you know, one of those fabulous geeky guys with pen holders in their pockets and too many wallets and lumpy pockets. And, and you go, oh my God, they have the courage just to be who they are. And then I think of that guy standing in the corner. And it isn't voluntary. He is that naked guy standing in the corner. It's a human tendency to, to let sleeping dogs lie. But his instincts are right. He, it takes one to know one. And this guy has a reason and a need for finding this stuff out. And if I can help him, I'm happy to do it. Uh, I have gone to Burkittsville trying to open up information on this, trying to get uh, new ideas, trying to interview some people. They're not interested. It took quite some trying to get some people to open up at all. Some people never will. You're basically, you're trying to burst everyone's illusions, and um, people don't take kindly to that. But if you care about what you're doing, if you believe in what you're doing, if you think you have a shred of the truth in your hands, you want to fill the hand up. You just want to get more. You need more information, you need to find more, and you hope to get the truth out in the light of day.